English phrase, you, you've all heard these jokes. You've all heard the jokes. You start with an English phrase, and then this, uh, this is translated into some other language, and then, and then the other language is translated back into English, and the joke comes because the, the, the retranslated phrase is, is just, just somehow misses something about the original. These days, these, uh, oops, sorry. Okay. Uh, these days, these jokes are generally talked, generally uh, 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 about uh, machine translation. Uh, but the, 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 the category of joke, I have to tell you, goes back more than 100 years. There's an extremely funny Mark Twain story about this. I can explain to that later on if you want. Uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, so, so here's what I'm going to be trying to do in this talk. Um, I work in something that, uh, that we could call the physics of information, quantum information theory, quantum computing, um, uh, foundation of thermodynamics, um, some, some things about black hole physics, and so on. Can all be sort of connected together under the general umbrella of the, the physics of information, and it can be kind of mathematical and technical. Um, uh, but then I talk to my friends, and I teach at a small college. Not all of my friends are physicists, and so so when I eat lunch with my friends, and they say, "Well, what do you want to?" Then I have to tell them something. Okay, and I, and I try to I try to tell them something that, that they find interesting about what I do. And so what, what I want to do is I want to take this translation from here to here, and I want to try to untranslate it. I want to take some of the ideas that I, that I uh, the, the heuristic ideas that I, that I mentioned to my friends, and I want to, I want to drag them back into a mathematical framework and see what we get. Of course, the amusing thing will be that it isn't necessarily what we started with, uh, but it will be this talk. Okay, um, uh, so here's what we're up to. What I want to do is I want to try to identify universal ideas about the notion of information. Um, very risky to do anything that can be attempted to be universal. And, um, uh, and the parallel that I want to draw is a parallel to, to category theory in mathematics. If you studied uh, mathematics, you studied algebra in particular, you know that there's a branch of mathematics which is basically um, uh, all about how different um, branches of mathematics are really doing the same thing. Um, that uh, uh, topological spaces and uh, homeomorphisms really have a lot of the same structure as groups and group isomorphisms. Um, and and the, uh, the branch of mathematics that tries to abstract these general features is called category theory, or as algebraists usually call it, general nonsense. Um, and, uh, uh, and there is a reasonable question, which, which is actually a question for you, and so you should keep this in mind throughout the talk. Is this useful? Because it may be amusing, uh, but the, the, the question is, does this give us anything that we didn't have before? Does this suggest problems to analyze that we might not have thought of? Um, <clears throat> we're not necessarily going to be talking about quantifying information. I'm not going to propose some universal measure of information. Um, uh, at least, uh, not yet. Um, uh, uh, that's maybe a, something, uh, something farther down in the program. Uh, on the other hand, our, and the reason is that it may be that, uh, that, that uh, no single quantity can capture all the aspects of the notion of information that we want to capture. On the other hand, um, uh, we may find some useful quantities. We may find some quantities that will help us understand what we mean by an information structure. So uh, we'll keep our eyes open for those. Um, we need guiding principles. And the guiding principles are going to be the sorts of things that I try to tell my friends at lunchtime. Um, heuristic ideas that, uh, that, that motivate us to uh, define things in certain way, ways. And the first one is, is, the, uh, is the idea that information is physical. Information is physical. And this is what was, was uh, 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 I think, most strongly stated by Rolf Landauer uh, back, oh, and, and the notion is that there's no such thing as disembodied information. Information is always associated with the state of a physical system. Of course, well, I'm a physicist, so, so maybe you factor that into your mind. But uh, the, 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 I want to take as a basic idea that information is a physical concept. The second thing is a, is a um, uh, something, uh, something a little bit more, uh, 
a little bit more fuzzy in my, in my view. And that is the idea that information is relational. Information is about the relations between things uh, rather than things in themselves. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, here's my translation of this into, uh, into, into, into physics speak. Uh, that, uh, that information refers to relations among the subsystems of a composite physical system. I have, I'm going to be talking about a physical system that has parts. And information is going to be about the relationships between the parts. The third idea um, is, is an idea which, uh, which um, Charles Bennett's idea has been, has been uh, very uh, uh, been a, a very strong uh, advocate for as being a fundamental thing about information, and that's that information is fungible. Fungible, of course, is an economic term. A, an asset is fungible if it can be uh, converted from one form to another very easily. And that's, that's, uh, that's the key idea uh, about information. Information can be transformed from one representation to another. Um, that uh, information can be, uh, I'll give you a funny example of that later on. You, you also understand what I mean. And, uh, and somehow, information is a property that is invariant under such transformations. So let's talk about this notion of invariance right here. Let's talk about this notion of invariance. Um, what do I mean by invariant? Well, okay, um, it's like in topology. In topology, we, we say that, a, uh, that a, a, a coffee cup shape is the same as a donut shape because there's a, um, uh, there's a, a transformation um, that, that will map, well, I've got two there, that tra the transformation that will map the coffee cup to the donut shape, a, a spatial distortion of space, and by another one that goes backwards, so that they're equivalent. In information theory, why do we say that this newspaper contains the same information as this electrical signal? Well, it's because there's a transformation <coughs> that, uh, that will allow me to construct the, uh, the electrical signal um, given the newspaper, and vice versa. So the, the, the existence of these, of these transformations is what we mean by two things being equivalent. And in this sense, information is, is like topology in that it studies the things that are invariant under these equivalents. Okay, so I got up this morning and I read the newspaper. But of course, I didn't actually read the newspaper. I don't remember that read the newspaper. What I did is I read the newspaper online. Um, so uh, what I actually got was an electrical signal over my over my Cat5 cable over in the over in the Union Club. Um, uh, I got an electrical signal, but uh, but I could uh, I could interpret that. What, what, what it meant was today's paper. <coughs> of course, there were many different possible newspapers that I could have gotten today. There are many that otherwise it wouldn't be news. Um, uh, you know, a different signal would have, been, would have been a different newspaper, uh, yet another signal would have been yet another newspaper, and so on. Okay? And um, uh, so the signal, I want, I want to refer to this, this electrical uh, impulse that, uh, that, that came into my room. Um, I, I want to refer to that as the signal, that's A, and B is the reference, that's the newspaper, and so for, 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 for the, um, uh, um, uh, for our purposes today, I, I'm going to imagine that there really is a newspaper uh, out there somewhere, uh, back at the newspaper office, with which I can compare the electrical signal and, uh, and, 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 and study the correlation. And uh, <coughs> there are many different messages, many different reference states, um, and uh, the a priori probability, the a priori situation, is described, I'm not telling you anything, but no, is described by a probability distribution. Over, um, over, over situations, over states of affairs. <coughs> and the information, it resides in the correlation of the signal and the reference. So, okay, let's, let's talk about the signal and the reference here. Both of them are physical systems. And so here's communication theory uh, in, 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 in a couple of slides. Um, <coughs> the reference is a newspaper. Um, and there's a signal that is, uh, that, that, that is associated with this newspaper. And then, you know, a lot happens to the signal on the way, on the way between, uh, 
between um, the, the newspaper office and me. Okay, all kinds of things happened to that signal. Um, uh, as, it, as, it, as it got transmitted, and, and, and there's all kinds of signal processing, and, and, and uh, sometimes it was an electrical signal, and then it was a microwave signal, and then it was an optical signal, and then it was an electrical signal again. All kinds of things happened. And so finally, and all kinds of uh, really sophisticated information uh, 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 things happened to it. And, and so finally, at the end of the day, I decoded it, got back, got the news. The thing I want to point out is that all this stuff happens to the signal. All of this stuff happens to the signal. Okay? <clears throat> so what does that mean? Well, so I, I said I'm going to describe things by a probability distribution. I'm going to have two random variables. One of them is going to represent the signal. The other is going to represent the referent. And, and, uh, uh, and, and I want to say that, uh, that the signal carries information about the reference, about the, the thing. That's, that's, that's how I would say things ordinarily. And so there's going to be a joint probability distribution over the variables A and B. The key point here is that the information resides in the correlation of these two variables. And that in a, in a communication process, only the signal is affected by the operation, not the reference. Only the signal is affected by the operation. So let's see what that means. What I mean, what I'm, I'm going to call these local A operations. These are operations that only affect the signal. And so that means that uh, in a probability distribution, it's going to be the same operation on each um, on each uh, uh, on each column in the table. That is to say, <coughs> a new probability distribution will be given by a bunch of conditional probabilities. Actually, the old probability distribution, but the conditional probabilities only involve the uh, the states of the signal. So, what can happen? Well, one thing that can happen is that. Perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps these things get 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 permuted around. Okay, in that case, nothing bad has happened because then I could later apply a second transformation, a second operation, still only applying it to the signal, and undo this permutation. So this is a reversible transformation, reversible in the sense that I can. I can restore the original probability distribution by another one of these guys. But then there are operations which are not reversible. An example of that would be if, uh, if the conditional probabilities actually blurred the distribution out. It, it, it smeared the probabilities out. Then no, um, no, subsequent, um, no subsequent operation that acts only on A could restore the original probability distribution. This is an irreversible transformation. So the idea is that in the first one, where I permuted the rows, since that's reversible, somehow I want to say that information is, is not lost. But here in the irreversible, um, in the irreversible transformation, I cannot restore the original state of affairs by only acting on the signal. And in this case, since I can't get back to the original state of affairs, I want to say that information is lost. Okay. This is all for now. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at this in a little, in a little bit more abstract way. Um, what's the information structure of what I just, just talked about? <coughs> well, I have my states, my states, the set of all possible states, the state here is a joint distribution over A and B, some joint probability distribution, and I've, I've represented that by a probability simplex. Of course, it's in some maybe very high dimensional states. Here it is. <coughs> and a, a, a particular state is a particular joint probability distribution that I start out with. And I want to think of the information as being contained in the correlation. So in the uh, joint probability distribution, um, uh, something happens, and I get a new um, probability distribution. 
uh, anarchy, and, and what sorts of things can happen? Well, I said that the, I've got a set of possible operations, <coughs> and these possible operations include all the operations that act only on A. And, uh, and when I say that, that P goes to P prime, that means that, um, that, that I can get P prime, the distribution P prime, out of this, out of the original distribution by applying some operation in my set of allowed operations. And P and P, P, and P prime are equivalent. They contain the same information if um, I can take uh, uh, P goes to P prime and P prime goes to P under operations in, in P. So I can go either way. The transformation is reversible. If the transformation is reversible, still staying only in my set of operations P, then I say <coughs> my, um, my uh, um, I say that I have the same information. There's no, there's no loss of information. And so, so I say that this has, that the, 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 this kind of, this kind of structure, um, or this kind of uh, situation imposes a natural information structure. Let me tell you what I mean by a natural information structure. I mean, first of all, you get from this a kind of a, a partial ordering on the states. Uh, partial ordering induced by what states can be mapped to what other states. And really, it's a partial ordering on equivalent class of states because there are some that are equivalent. There are reversible and irreversible operations within our set of possible operations. So what does this have to do with quantum physics? I'm giving a kind of an abstract way of looking at, at uh, um, some, of the, some of the notions in, in, in ordinary communication. Oh, before we get to that, sorry, I forgot the best part of it. Ah, okay. I want to talk about monotones. Monotones um, uh, are not, as you might suppose, um, the non but what they are is um, a monotone is a function of a probability distribution, a function of a probability distribution, um, which is uh, which can never decrease, no, can never increase, rather, can never increase under the action of one of our allowed operations. It can never, it can never go up. The, the monotone can go down, or it can stay the same, but it can never go up under the action of one of our allowed operations. And so, so we all know uh, by an example of that, um, uh, an example of that uh, uh, in the case of, uh, of ordinary information theory, uh, there's the classical entropy of a probability distribution, and if we make from that the mutual information, which is this combination of entropies of the marginal and joint distribution, um, then what we find is that uh, the mutual information is a monotone. If we, if we um, uh, apply one of these local A operations, we can never increase the mutual information between the two variables. Furthermore, we find that, uh, that um, the, 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 uh, uh, this is a, a, another much deeper and more marvelous fact, that um, an operation is reversible if and only if the mutual information is unchanged. The only if part is pretty obvious because um, because if the mutual information goes down, then you can never increase it by a subsequent operation. So you can never restore the original um, state of affairs. The uh, the if part is actually um, quite cool, and uh, and so so one one nice thing about the mutual information is it, is it allows us to exactly diagnose which operations are reversible and which ones are not. And so I might call, uh, in, in, in my private uh, private nomenclature, this is not just an, a monotone that, that helps us determine whether something's reversible. It's an expert monotone. It tells us exactly whether or not it's reversible. Um, but uh, although the, the term monotone is a, is a fairly common term in uh, quantum information theory, expert monotone is nobody. Okay, so now let's talk about quantum communication theory. This is a, a kind of quantum information. In quantum communication theory, we're talking about quantum systems. 
the systems involved, involved in our communication theory are quantum mechanical. Um, I have a couple of systems, A and B. They're quantum systems. Um, and the composite system of A and B is described by a, a, a state, rho AB. And, and, uh, and so right now, there's going to be a problem. And the problem is that if you don't know quantum mechanics, you might think that you're not going to follow what's going to happen next. But I think that if I've done my job right, you should be able to pick up a general lesson knowing almost no quantum mechanics. Okay? So, so this <coughs> experiment, you can tell me later if it worked. All right? Uh, this is described by a density operator. Basically, it's a positive operator on a complex Hilbert space, which, uh, which um, is, uh, has trace one. Um, and, and indeed, uh, uh, there's a little bit more, more detail we can get. Um, usually, we, 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 uh, in, in introductory kinds of quantum mechanics, we say that there's a, a mathematical vector of visible space called the Hilbert space, which uh, describes the, the, the state. <coughs> the density operator is actually, uh, there's a notation this way, which means it's a projection operator onto the state. Um, and we can also have um, probabilistic combinations of states. Um, which are which are mixed states. These mixed states are distinct from the uh, the, the, the superposition states that you've heard about, like the superposition of the cat alive and cat dead state uh, in, in, in Schrodinger's famous thought experiment. Um, but um, uh, uh, and, and those those things happen at this level. But we can also sort of uh, uh, in, a, in a, just a random way mix mix some states together to form. It's, it's like a um, living. So what we're going to do is we're going to restrict our set of operations to local operations on one of these systems. Maps of the form uh, E tensor A, where E, where E is um, uh, is the uh, is is uh, uh, some operation E tensor one. One is the identity operation on B, and so this is one of our things. You do something A, and you just leave B alone. We allow all operations of that form. So this is communication theory, and we're going to want to think of B as the reference, and A as the, as the signal system. <coughs> OK. Uh, we want to say that A carries quantum information about B. And somehow that quantum information is going to be um, something about the correlations between A and B. Okay, so what's the information structure? Well, okay, here's, the, here's uh, a, a highly schematic picture of the uh, set of all possible states of A and B. It's, a, it's actually a slice of the positive cone of the bounded operators of the Hilbert space of the states of A and B. Our set of operations is the set of operations of this form. And it turns out that what this, what this means is that this, this space of all possible states is foliated by a bunch of flat slices, okay? It's foliated by a bunch of flat slices. And if we, if we pull out, what, what I mean by that, if we pull out one of these slices, then, then what this is, is, is this is um, the set of all joint states for which the marginal state, this rho sort of acts like a probability distribution here, the marginal quantum state for B, the one that you don't mess with, is the same for all the state for all the joint states in here. The marginal state for B is exactly the same. The marginal distributions of, of, of all distributions of all observables. <coughs> and and the reason that's cool is because if you take an A operation, if you take an operation out of my set P, then you stay on a leaf. You stay on a leaf. You don't change the B state because you're only acting on A. And that means that when we analyze how um, operations of this type um, act on my whole space, I can actually just restrict my attention to a single leaf and describe that. Uh, because the leaves, the leaves act independent, are independent. OK, that's kind of cool. Um, so what's, what does the leaf look like? Right, here's a particular leaf with a particular state uh, of, of B. And this leaf consists of the joint states of A, B that are consistent with that state of B. Well, down here at the bottom, there's a set of states 
is a set of states which are the minimal information states. Um, they are, they are the, the, the product states. They're, they're uh, the states which are simply a state of A, tensor product state of B, no correlation whatsoever between them. And it turns out that if you start with any state of the leaf, there is an operation that will take you, in fact, to any point in this bottom, in this bottom section. There's an operation which will take you down to the bottom. And anything can get here. Okay? It's it's you can always wind up there. And then up at the top, there are the maximal information states. Okay? The maximal information states. And what are those guys? Well, they include um, the uh, they include the pure joints, the pure states, the states that are um, that are described by a pure state vector um, of, of both of both uh, um, of, of both systems, unmixed, entangled, entangled, pure entangled states. You've heard of entangled, um, would, would reside in here. <coughs> and it turns out that any two pure states that are in this uh, that are in this, uh, that are in this uh, top part of the leaf, the maximal information states, um, are equivalent to each other. You can go from one to the other um, by a local A operation. And it turns out that, uh, that if you start with one of these guys, um, if you start with one of these guys, you can make any other state in the leaf. And it turns out that uh, there, that's in some really interesting examples, um, you can actually have mixed states that actually are also information maximal. Um, in some ways, um, you ever heard of the subject of quantum error correction? If you zoom back for far enough and take the largest possible view, uh, this is just quantum error correction. That, that's, that's our job here, is to zoom back really far and take the largest possible view. Um, so uh, what about this whole question of reversibility? I've made a big deal out of that. Well, the, there's, a, there's a quantum mechanical version of the entropy, which has to do with the trace of an operator rather than a sum. Um, and uh, uh, there's something called the coherent information, which is, uh, uh, you'll see, is, a, is an entropy of, of system A minus the joint entropy. This is, a, this is a quantity which can never be positive classically, but, but can be positive quantum mechanically because of quantum entanglement. It is, in fact, possible for the joint entropy to be zero, but the entropy of a, uh, of, 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 of a local state to be something very large. That's when you have a pure entanglement. Um, so the coherent information has been, has been a focus of a lot of work in, in quantum information theory. That's why I bring it up. Uh, and, uh, uh, and if you sort of plot the uh, contours of, uh, of coherent information, it looks kind of like this. And um, for any operation, it turns out that I is non-increasing. Any operation, of course, in our special set. You can't increase the coherent information by, um, uh, by a local operation on A. Furthermore, this is a very deep theorem. This is a very, very deep theorem, and, and, and it's actually very recent. Um, an operation is reversible if and only if the coherent inf information is unchanged by the operation. And then there's another theorem, which is kind of cool, which is that if you start with a maximal state, you start with something that was up, that was up in the top wedge up there, and and uh, you have a um, you have an operation which changes the coherent information, reduces it a little bit, a little bit, a tiny bit, um, by epsilon, then we can do another operation that approximately reverses the, uh, the original one. So, so um, an operation is reversible if and only if um, uh, the, uh, the coherent information is unchanged, and it's approximately reversible. Um, if and only if the coherent information is approximately unchanged, at least for at least for things at the top of the leaf. This is not known in general. So that's kind of cool. Um, uh, what else? What else? Is, what else is good here? Oh yeah. yeah. This is it. This is this is the most important slide of the talk. All right. So 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 get ready. Our concept of information depends on the set of possible states of our system, and also 
also the set of possible operations for our system. That set should be a semi-group with unity, that is to say, you can compose operations and you can also do nothing. But, uh, um, uh, which is the identity. So, so um, the set of, of operations, uh, given such a, such a semi-group of identity, um, uh, then that will determine your concept of information. Your concept of information has to do with has to do with what the possible operations are. Now, I've been talking about operations that act only on one, only on one of the uh, of the individual systems. Um, uh, and, 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 that, and that set determines what I mean by information in that communication theory. <coughs> now, if you can do any operation at all, then your information theory is generally trivial. Okay? If you can turn any state into any other state, all states are equivalent, and, 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 and nothing is interesting. So, so as, a, as, a, um, as a sort of a philosophical point here, it's the limitations of the set of possible transformations that make things interesting. The limitations make things interesting. Um, life is awesome. Uh, so, so here I'm going to give you three different information theories. Um, uh, and in fact, you can easily see that, uh, that by choosing different, I'm giving you a universal information theory uh, paper generating schema. Okay, um, that, that, uh, that what you need to do is go out and find a really interesting set of transformations, and then work on the information theory under that set of transformations. There you go. And I've given you your entire career to do a follow up. And so, so, uh, uh, so one example is if you have a pair of systems, A, B, and you only allow local A operations, and I haven't said that this is quantum mechanical or classical, but anyway, you get what we might call a communication theory. Um, you think of A as a, as a message or a signal, and I have a reference B, and the, and the signal uh, undergoes various transformations. This is the kind of uh, a theory you're building. Here's another one. Suppose you're, what you have is you have a really big system, immensely complex, but you know, you can't do just any operation on it. You can only affect a few large-scale observables. Okay, like like you have you have a, a, a system that contains that contains a trillion trillion gas molecules, but you can't individually deal with the gas molecules. All you can do is sort of sort of change the volume of the thing in which they're enclosed, or or dump some energy in to speed them up, or something like that. You can only affect a few macroscopic variables. Then what kind of information theory do you? I would argue you have thermodynamics. The thermodynamics is best viewed as a kind of information theory. A theory about what processes are reversible and what processes are irreversible under a certain set of, of uh, limitations on your ability to intervene in the system. Finally, this is a really interesting one that, that, uh, that, that has been very, very highly studied quantum information theory, now another information theory having to do with quantum mechanics. <coughs> we have a pair of quantum systems. A pair of quantum systems, A, B. A pair of quantum systems, A and B, with, uh, with local operations. I can do things locally, and I can send classical messages back and forth. And, uh, and, and then I get the notion of information I have is quantum entanglement. I get quantum entanglement. So let's talk about these. Uh, let's talk about these local operations in classical communication. What do I mean by that? What I've got is a composite system, A, B, two systems, and I have to think of them as being located in separate laboratories. In other words, when I do experiments on these systems, I have to do experiments on the systems individually. So, so what I mean is that I can do so the, the operations that I can perform here include quantum operations, including any sort of measurement that I want, on A and B separately. Okay? So I can, I can do something on A, and then I can do something different on B. Okay? And I'm also going to allow myself to 
to exchange ordinary classical messages, you know, use the phone or something, about the results of my measurements. So if I got a measurement result on A, I can send that measurement result over to B. Now, so that, uh, uh, if these were classical systems, then these two things, local operations plus classical exchange of information, would be enough to do anything. Your information theory would be trivial because all operations would be possible. And I could convert any joint distribution into any other joint distribution if I were allowed to do anything locally that I wanted and to exchange messages. So these are classical systems. This would be a trivial theory. But it's not a trivial theory for quantum systems. There are things you cannot do by this set of operations. And so that makes this interesting. It's interesting, A, because it's not everything, and interesting, B, because this is a place where classical and quantum um, information theories differ. So uh, let's talk about entangled states. Um, T is our set of local operations and class of communications uh, uh, operations, LOCC, abbreviation of universal quantum information theory. And um, there are minimal states states that you can make from any other state, states that you can't get, it's once you're there, you can't get out of. And that includes product states, um, where there's no correlation at all. It also includes something called separable states. And these are states where, where um, you have product states which are mixed together incoherently. So it's as if you flip the coin to decide which product state you made. And, and, and these are, these are um, all of these states can be made, turned into one another by local operations and class communication, but there are a whole bunch of states out here which can't be uh, made from these guys, and those are entangled states. Those are ones that are not separable. So those operations can take you around you here, but if one of those operations takes you from the blue part to the green part, you can't go back. You can't make everything out of the separable states. The states that are not separable are entangled. And an example of that is a, a pure entangled state. This is a, a, a pure state vector, and it, it, is, uh, it, is, it is really, really not separate. OK. Um, and and these, uh, these entangled states are really interesting in part because of a theorem uh, due to John Bell in 1964. And, and basically, he showed that the statistical correlations between entangled systems cannot be simulated by any classical system. Any, any, any uh, separated classical systems that uh, that uh, uh, that there, there are statistical aspects of the correlations between entangled systems that that cannot be reflected by separated classical systems, and so entanglement really is something new. It's not just you know some weird thing in our mathematics that really what's going on is there's separated classical systems. No, no, no. It's um, it's uh, uh, it's sometimes called quantum non-locality, and these guys. So, with your permission, in order to get to the, the cool stuff at the end, I'm going to skip the section where I delve into entanglement more deeply. Okay. Hearing no objection. Okay. <coughs> what I want to do is I want to I want to now turn to I, I've been talking about the, the, the idea of what information is. I want to now turn to the idea, the question of what computation is. Um, information processing is a physical process. So, so if Landauer tells us that no information without representation, so I'm going to take you out of um, If Landauer tells us that there's no information without, without representation here, I want to say there's no information processing without a physical process. <coughs> that, that information processing is always realized by the dynamical evolution of a physical system. And sometimes we allow ourselves to idealize this a little bit, but, but basically, we're always, we always have to be talking about the um, dynamical evolution of a, of a possible physical system. And, uh, and, and so what I want to ask is, how do we classify different computation processes? I mean, you know, if you see the, uh, uh, um, uh, how, how do I say that this process is of this kind, that process is of that kind? Uh, when can I say that two 
and the idea of one of illusions do the same computation. Uh, because sometimes, um, uh, we want to say this computer and that computer, undergoing very different internal evolutions, are actually somehow doing the same computation. When is that true? How do we recognize two things as being the same computation? Um, and, uh, and, and the key idea here is that one process can simulate another. This is, a, uh, this is a, an important idea when we're, um, when we're talking about things like quantum computers. In what sense is what the dynamic, is what the, you know, is what the Schrodinger equation does for my quantum computer? In what sense is that a computation? How can I, how can I make precise what I mean by a computation? How do I know that what this quantum computer is doing is what that quantum computer is doing if they have very different internal functions? So let's talk about the general idea of simulation. Once again, we're going to take category theory as our, uh, as our, uh, um, as our inspiration. So what I imagine is I have a, 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 a state, quantum state row, and it evolves under some evolution operator, operation E, and it can be any kind of operation. I, 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 this is quantum mechanics. And uh, I've got a set of possible input states, um, uh, which I'll call G, possible input states. And yeah, row could be input states, sigma could be input, input states, or something. Uh, and, um, and what I'm going to say is I want to simulate I want to simulate the, um, uh, this operation, this, this, this time evolution. And what I mean is that there's another thing I can do. There's another thing that can happen, C, which can then be followed by F, which can then be followed by D, so that, so that in the end, um, uh, the, uh, I, I say that F simulates E, F simulates E on G, if there exists C and D such that if I that, that row mapping e, e row, e, the E row is equal to the composition of C, F, and D acting on row for all rows in my in my initial uh, uh, in my initial set. Okay? That I could that I can uh, I, I could get get from from here to here, either by doing E or by doing F, if I first do C and then do D. Um, uh, in, in, the, in the algebraic style, um, I can uh, write this a little bit differently. Uh, and rather than an arrow between states, it's an arrow between sets of states um, uh, that I have a diagram here that I'm mapping from E to the image of E. And, uh, and I say this simulates this if, uh, if there exists C and D such that this diagram commutes, that, uh, that this map is the same as this map. Category theory, in one point of view, in one point of view, is just all about arrows between things, and 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 then you have this idea that the diagram commutes if it doesn't matter how you get from one place to another using the arrows. That's pretty cool. Um, and uh, and I should uh, I should say that uh, that we're going to this is going to require refinement. Okay, what I mean by this. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's uh, busy ourselves with refinement. <coughs> this is really the idea underlying the notion of a physical computer. Okay? Because computation is an abstract process where you have the input of the abstract computer defined as an element of some set, and then you have the abstract computation, which is some mathematical function, and then you have the result of the computation, which is some abstract set. Okay? What really happens when you do a real physical computation, is that you map the input state of the, act, um, of the abstract computer to um, the, the, um, the initial state of some physical device. You have a state preparation of physical device. And then the physical device percolates along uh, according to the laws of physics for a while, and then, um, and then you, uh, you make a measurement on the final device state you look at it, and and, uh, and and that somehow gives you the result of the, the abstract result of the computation. So this this structure here is of course is of course what what's really going on underneath when we talk about a, a, a physical computer actually doing a particular abstract computation. So and that means to be radical here. Means to be whatever the opposite of radical, unradical. Okay. So, we've got this uh, diagram, we've got, uh, 
I'm, um, we've got it uh, commuting. And I want to say, I want to see what this diagram means if I wanted to talk about communication. Okay, so communication is a kind of computation. So, uh, so what kind of, what, what, how should I, how can I talk about the notion of communication in this way? Well, so um, my set of states are joint states of a, um, of a, of a, of a composite system. And my, um, and my uh, uh, process here, the process that I'm going to try to simulate, is some interaction that accomplishes some communication task. I don't know how it does it, but, but, but it, it accomplishes some communication task. Well, <clears throat> when, I, when I want to see whether I can accomplish the same task with F, it would be cheating if I really did all the work in C and D. Okay? Uh, in fact, what I would like to do, what I would like to do is I'd like to, to make it, in order to compare F with E, I'd like to make C and D um, do no communication at all in any way. So, so what I do is I'm going to require that C is actually, is actually a product operation. That I do the same thing to A and B here. So there's no information exchange. And I do the same thing to A and B here, so there's no information exchange. And then, then I can compare this guy with this guy. I can see whether this uh, interaction can So I'm going to need a restriction on C and D. Similarly, let's talk about computational complexity. We're going to see the physicist version of computational complexity. Here. Now this is the, the extraordinarily naive physicist version of computational complexity. Here you go. All right. We want to compare the length or cost of the processes. We want to know, we want to be able to assign somehow, somehow a length, because we want to know if it's very extensive, um, long, uh, um, process can be simulated by something which is cheaper. It's very important. You know? um, I mean, by some other physical process, some other computation, some other um, dynamical evolution of my computer. And, and I, don't want to, I don't want to hide the cost in C and D. So what we're going to do is we're going to require that C and D be drawn from some special restricted short or cheap um, uh, computation. We wouldn't want we wouldn't want all of the uh, computational work really to be in this extraordinarily difficult translation from the G state to the, to the input state for that. If it, if it was all in here, we'd be kind of disappointed. So we're going to require these guys to be to be uh, to be really not very not very uh, uh, not very complicated. And if, and if that's the case, if if, if these are say um, processes which take time, it's probably going to be um, then, uh, then we can we can really ask interesting questions about whether F can simulate E and vice versa. Um, in particular, we can we can tell whether it's, it's shorter to go this way because it might be that E is really long and it takes a lot of a, a lot of, uh, of resources, whatever my resources are, and, and then and then it might be much shorter. To go this way. Okay, so what we've got is we've got really two sets of operations here. We've got um, a set of computations, and E and F are both sets of possible computations. But then we have a restricted set, a set of translations, coding and decoding operations, and C and D have to be members of that restricted set. And so if you have a set of computations and a more restricted set of translations, you can begin to ask the question whether this can simulate that. Given C and T, when can F simulate E on G? <clears throat> in fact, even in trivial cases, you actually get some interesting answers. I'll just uh, tell you this a little bit. I'm now going to go back to consider quantum mechanics. I've got a quantum system here, the set of quantum states. And I've got an operation, I've got a quantum operation here, and I want to know when this other quantum operation can simulate this quantum operation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just imagine I'm going to just imagine that, that my operations are just all possible quantum operations. Okay? All possible quantum operations um, uh, are possible for, for E, C, F, and D. Okay? Um, when can F simulate E? And it turns out you actually get interesting answers to this. Um, for instance, 
There are minimal operations, or I'm sorry, maximal operations. There are operations f that can simulate anything uh, in this in this in this context. Simulate in this sense. Simulation, of course, is relative to these set of operations. It turns out that if f is what's called unitary, it's a reversible operation, then it can simulate any operation. Similarly, there are minimal operations. If E is a constant operation, that is to say it always maps everything to the same state over here, like it erases it or randomizes it or something, um, then uh, it turns out that it can be simulated by any F. That's, 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 that's moderately easy. Um, um, but of course, th th there is much more you can do here because uh, the system of cases just doesn't have much <clears throat> okay, there's also something you can do. Remember there were, there were special quantities called monotones which helped us out in the information idea. So there will also be monotones which are things that help us out in the simulation idea. And so let me construct what I mean by uh, something I, that would be a simulation monotone. I'm almost done. Suppose I have a function of an input state and an operation such that this is true. What I mean is that, in fact, X is a monotone, um, is a monotone on states for processes in C. Okay? And there's a, if it were my information monotones, then I can make this happen. Um, and uh, K here is, is just anything in C. And then I maximize, I maximize this monotone over all the inputs. Call that X star, which is a function only of the uh, only of the operation. Then it turns out that X star of that operation, if I just apply my rules here, my my, my, uh, my rule here, I find out that X star of the E operation has to be less than or equal to X star of the F operation, which means that F can simulate E only if this inequality is true. These simulation monotones are sort of, sort of measure how much oomph this operation has. <clears throat> and you can't, you can't simulate operation E by another operation which doesn't have as much oomph. Oomph is not a very good term. Of course, what's the intuition here? The intuition is that in our item of information, we had sort of states, we had certain allowed operations, and the monotone was non increasing under, was something that was non increasing under T. And that helps us diagnose reversibility and irreversibility. Computation, in, in, in computation, we have a set of computations. And we also have a set of coding and decoding operations, this translation of the C. And the simulation monotone was not increasing under, under, under computation operations. And the um, and, and so N is something like a measure of the information content. And if you lose some of the information content, you can't get it back. Whereas, whereas uh, uh, XR is something like the information capacity of a um, of a of, of a uh, of an operation with respect to a, um, uh, a set of computations and a set of information. Now, what I try, what what we've been trying to do here is we've been trying to take we've been trying to come up with with notions of information that are actually extracted from, that are actually extracted from the work in quantum information. So let's 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 sum up a little bit. The idea here is that is that information is physical, relational, and fungible. And our concept of information depends on the set of possible operations that we may perform. Quantum information theory actually gives us several different inequivalent interesting sets of operations. For example, there's the set of local A operations, which gives you a kind of communication theory. There's also the set of local operations and class communication, which give you entanglement theory. And there are actually several others, uh, uh, which, are, which are generalizations of the above. And um, uh, information may be preserved by reversible operations or lost in irreversible operations. And these quantities called monotones can help us distinguish these situations. Computation is based on the idea that we can 
simulate one process by another. Capacity quantities, information capacity quantities, uh, can help us distinguish whether this is public. So these are sort of gener generic ideas about, about information. Here's some things we have to talk about. Let's see it's a big list, a small type. Um, that's the most important thing about this slide. And we, we haven't talked about asymptotic limits, we haven't talked about quantifying the resources we need to do various information tasks. We haven't talked, we haven't really taken apart that classical communication part of the local operations of classical communication. Because evidently that's an information task job thing too. So we sort of assume that and talk about this information too. Um, we haven't talked about ways of measuring entanglement or fidelity, that is to the nearness of states. We haven't uh, we haven't uh, talked about um, quantifying the complexity of operations and so on. We haven't talked about the ideas um, uh, of uh, John Wheeler and, and, and others um, about possibly using information ideas to try to derive the law of physics from this idea. Or the idea of interpreting quantum mechanics as a, um, as a, a theory not of physics so much as a theory of knowledge, sort of a Bayesian approach. Uh, we haven't talked much about thermodynamics, I'll leave my hands out a little bit. And, and I really also haven't talked about how I'm really going to explain this to my friends because, of course, obviously, if the quantum mechanics wasn't, wasn't very good, something like category theory. Um, but that's not the point of the talk. The point of the talk is to try to is to try to see from our experience in quantum information theory whether there's something, whether there's a general structure that we can we can then apply in different situations. And that I'd be happy to answer any questions. Coming back to your uh, first question at the beginning of the talk, which is, what does all of this formalism then buy you at the end of the day? <laughs> right. Yes, it buys you by, I guess, giving a more precise and more clean framework, etc. Yes. 
but you know, about 90% of you know, what you have said, just module a couple of you know, the theorems. Right. This you know, precisely how we actually understand these things to Correct. be. Correct. So true. my question to you then is, what do you expect to get out of it at the end of the day that's actually new, that's quite fundamentally new? Can you build a physics from some axiom that you then set up from here? Is there any hope for such a thing? Or where is it in your view? Um, let me, uh, let me um, um, uh, um, uh, give you a couple of specific things which I think grow out of thinking in this way. Um, one is uh, the question about, uh, when, when, remember I said that the coherent information was, was an expert monotone. That is to say that the, uh, a, a, a local clone operation was reversible if and only if the coherent information was unchanged. Actually, um, uh, the uh, uh, um, we had actually proved some special cases of this, and what we didn't know is that there was a general fact. Okay, we didn't know that we, we proved special cases of this for for pure initial states and so on. Okay, we proved that the coherent information holds exactly when we could we could do what's called quantum error correction to restore the original state, and. Um, uh, uh, but it was by thinking of information as simply being about the general correlations of systems, and by asking the question, what can help us diagnose the possible reversibility that allowed us to, to, um, to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, prove this theorem. Now this theorem actually has a couple of special cases. One of them tells us when we can do perfect quantum error correction, perfect error correction on, on uh, uh, quantum states that have interacted with the environment and, and, and cancel out the, 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 the effects of noise for, for a pure entangled state, something that might be important in a quantum computer with a noisy memory. But it also turns out to have in it another theorem um, as a special case, which is about the transmission of classical information by quantum, by quantum systems. That, that, that simply allows, it, what that simply does is we take a different class of input states and the coherent information, once again, can tell us exactly when we can recover the classical information in the presence of noise. And so, so um, uh, I guess, um, uh, so that, that's one example. Another example is the thing I skipped over, which is um, uh, where we talk about, um, uh, this, the thing I skipped over has to do with, with what entanglement is. And, um, uh, and it turns out that there are, um, that entanglement is different from ordinary correlations in the following way. If I have a random variable A that is correlated with another random variable B, perhaps as correlated as they can possibly be, that does not prevent A from also being correlated with another random variable C and another random variable D and so on. That the correlations in, in, uh, in classical mechanics are in this way promiscuous. Um, uh, the, actually, this term is actually, actually used, but that's because I'll have a very good time with quantum information here. Um, uh, but entanglement, if quantum systems A and B are in a state of maximum entanglement, then it turns out they can't be entangled with anybody else. Okay? They, they can't have also be, uh, if A is entangled with B in the, in the maximal possible way, it cannot be entangled with C at all, or D or E. So, so entanglement is monogamous in this case. And, and, and that insight came from, um, from trying to, to, um, to think about the allowed transformations of entanglement. What's possible? What are, what are the possible allowed transformations? So I guess what I'm trying to say is that this, this general framework suggests specific questions to ask. Sometimes those specific questions have really good answers that are enlightening. And that's what a general framework is supposed to do. If you look at category theory, category theory is kind of interesting in some ways it is a kind of a curiosity in algebra, okay? Um, uh, it does a couple of things. One thing is, it, uh, it says, uh, 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 it allows you to take shortcuts in proofs because there are certain segments of proofs that are the same in every kind of algebraic structure. You say, okay, and so by general nonsense, we know this, all right? <coughs>